The Tolkien Road, Episode 62, The Lord of the Rings, The Ring Goes South. Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to the Tolkien Road, a long walk through the works and philosophy of J.R.R. Tolkien. On this episode, we continue through The Lord of the Rings with Book 2, Chapter 3, The Ring Goes South. Before we get started, why not hop on over to iTunes and leave The Tolkien Road a rating and feedback? It's a great way to show your support for the show and takes less than a minute. Thanks for listening, and enjoy. Hey everybody, welcome to The Tolkien Road. Greta, what's new? What's shaking? What's shaking? Not much. Shaking with you. Not much. Not much. Just ready to do another episode of the Tolkien Road? Yeah. We're a yeah. little bit late on this one. It's Running a couple a days. Behind. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Life happens. Yeah, well, it's been, uh, yeah, the month of May for us is kind of, kind of busy. So, busy. Yeah. yeah. Totally busy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it was busy this past weekend, and then it'll be busy the rest of this month too so I'm not sure how many episodes we're gonna get squeezed out this month but um this is one of them that's for sure that's right we are on the road this is one of the episodes of the Tolkien Road podcast that we record yes yes of all of them this is one hopefully we make yeah. it to completion yes we I'm never sure know. we shall I have a feeling we will I have hope I have this you have a feeling just conviction can't fight this feeling any longer. Mm. Oh, I thought you were going to mention the new Justin Timberlake song. No. I have no. no idea what that song even is. It's pretty catchy. It has something to do with catching and feeling. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's, it is. It's a, it's a good dance song. You could definitely get your groove on to it. Man, it's well... It's going to be the song of the summer. That's what they're saying. Well, that's, uh, that's good that they are saying that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we'll just move along. Move along. Uh, I did want to um, mention, uh, so, you know, I want to start, you know, highlighting a little bit more of, like, the correspondence and that kind of stuff we receive. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, so we received a, a bit of correspondence recently that I wanted to share from a, a gentleman named Rob Fangman. Fangman. Rob? That's right. Awesome. Rob. So, hey, Rob. Um, he said, I've recently started listening to your podcast and I just wanted to tell you, I think it's great. Keep it up. Oh, also, awesome. which Thanks, is you know, swell. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I always love hearing that. Um, and he said, also, I just read the lay of Lithian and I don't know if you will ever do an episode on it, but I wanted to share my favorite passage. After Baron has been rescued by Luthien, he sends her back to Doriath and laments that he won't see her, but takes solace in this passage. Though all to ruin fell the world and we've we're dissolved and backwards hurled, unmade into the old abyss. Yet were it's making good for this, the dawn, the dusk, the earth, the sea, that Luthien a time should be. Thanks, Rob mm-hmm. Fangman. So, uh, I, and I told him this when I replied to his, his email, but yeah, at some point we're going to do the, we're going to go through and we're going to read all the different lays and discuss them. Uh, Lay of Lithian is, of course, the one about um, uh, Baron and Luthien. So, why is it called the Lay of Lithian? Uh, it's so um, the word Lithian. I think it, I, if I recall, it means release. I think, like or um, freedom. Like, oh, yeah. Okay. So I think that's right, but I could be wrong. I, it's. I know he talks about it at the beginning of this, at the uh, prologue to the Silmarillion, but. Um, yeah. So maybe I'm wrong on that, but I think that was right. But we'll see when okay. we get there. So eventually we'll come back and read to. that. But uh, mostly, awesome. you know, it's just nice to hear, hear always hear from people who are, yeah. uh, you know, absolutely uh, want to say, hey, they're listening and uh, uh, they enjoy the podcast. So. Yes, absolutely. It's, uh, it's a real shot in the arm for us. Yeah. Keeps us and going. Maybe all we need is a shot in the arm. Maybe it is. Maybe. 
baby, all we need is a shot of me out. Something in my veins, bloodier than blood. Something in my veins, bloodier than blood. Something in my veins. You're supposed to keep going with bloodier harmonize, than yeah. Blood. Something in my veins, bloodier than blood. I can't harmonize, you know that. I know. I, it would have gotten, gotten weird if we kept on going. <laughs> No, you just come up with some funky harmonies, that's all. Yeah, they're not traditional harmonies, Yeah, you I come think. up with some, uh, you know, funky, uh, you know, I think they're like Australian harmonies or something like that. Oh, is that what they yeah. are? Yeah. I didn't know that that was what they were called. Yeah, Australian, like, Aborig- Aboriginal American. harmonies. Oh, Aboriginal, like I see where you're going with that. Well, oh, they're, like, they're like okay. a combination of Australian, Aboriginal, Tasmanian Something Whoa. like that. I don't even know what I'm talking about. Whoa. All right, moving on. I'm starting to get offended. Why? Aboriginal? Tasmanian? Tasmania is a country down there. I know, and it's associated with the devil. No, you're thinking of you're thinking of the animal, the Tasmanian devil. Yes, I am. And you're saying that my harmonizing sounds like the screech of the Tasmanian devil. Well, that's not a screech. He's more like, blah, blah. Have you ever seen oh, the, uh, the Bloody Tunes? Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that was accurate. I don't know if that's really accurate. Uh, yeah. yeah. Man, well, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. That was really, really encouraging. I appreciate that. Sorry that Greta started getting all weird on your, after your comment. I'm not the one that started the song. Yeah. I was just Were you the one that made the reference to well, Shot in the Arm? I didn't realize that. By Wilco. I should have known that it would turn into a song. Yeah. Yeah. So, my apologies. All right. Um... Yeah, moving on. Yes, so quickly. M- moving on quickly. What are we moving on quickly to? Hmm. We're moving on quickly to... Is it that time? Could it be? Of course. Already? Oh, yeah. Talk about getting your groove on. This is uh, one of those songs. That's the song of the summer right there. It's a song of every summer. Of every summer, of every season, not just the yeah, summer. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Summer, spring, winter, and fall. There it is. Boom. Yeah. Awesome. All, All right. right. Haiku that's haiku time. time. You got your haiku written. I noticed you were just like writing it <laughs> as we were talking. So I'm it's been a busy day. Looking forward to hearing this. This majestic yeah. haiku that you came up with as you were doing something else, multitask haiku. What were we listening to the other day that was talking about how women are like I think it was amazingly the, uh, able to multitask. And I remember listening to that to that about them saying how good women were at multitasking and that's what makes them such good moms or whatever. And I was thinking, I'm not a good multitasker. I'm I don't really know that that's not. true. I don't think, don't think well, I don't think multita- I think multitasking is overrated. Well, I'm not a good multitasker, so I was I felt I was a little bummed when they were saying how all moms that's what makes moms good moms is multitasking and it comes naturally to women and I'm like, uh oh, means I'm not a good woman or a good mom because I can't multitask. So don't get your hopes up too high with this haiku. That's all I'm saying. All right. All right. Can we do some haiku now? And then let's do some rock paper scissors. Oh. Quietly. Rock. I went. You cheated. No, I didn't. Yeah, you saw what I was going to do. <laughs> well, if you show your hand. Did I show my hand? I don't know, but I didn't I okay. didn't do anything on Fine. purpose. Fine. You win. Who's going first? I think first? you're just a sore loser. Whatever. Um, you're a sore loser. Uh, you go first. All right. Here's my haiku for uh, chapter six, three. Yeah, uh-huh. The rain goes south. Okay. Here it is. I hope, I hope it's chapter three. I hope it's chapter three. Because it's like, all like, is it chapter three we're doing? <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm ready. Uh, Wait, we're doing chapter, chapter three. Right? All right, here it is. Nine brave souls embark, leaving Rivendell behind, trading light for dark. No. Dude, I rhymed. I wasn't even trying to. Embark in dark. Well, that makes it a true poem. That makes it a true poem. And not we, just is it a, ha- is a haiku, but it's a true poem. And we know this is true because, because it, rhymes. it rhymes. That's right. True that, yo. That's funny. I was just talking about that with one of the kids this evening about that line in the Lego movie. Yeah. I'll read it one more time so that everybody can pick up on the rhyme. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, yeah, I did it again. You just can't stop. Oh, man. Your rhyming machine, they just I flow am. out of you. Huh. Wow, this is pretty wild. I really like my style. I right, hear you. Nine brave souls embark, leaving Rivendell behind, trading light for dark. I think we should call you the Poetry Shark. Poetry Shark? Yeah. That was my adding a rhyme onto your... I know. Rhyme. I got it. Yeah. I got it. I like that. I'm just trying to leave my mark. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I just hope that dog next door doesn't bark. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Or else we'd have to be all like, hark. <laughs> hark. I hear a bark. All right. Is it a lark? Or is it a shark? Read your haiku again. I can't even remember what it said. <laughs> One more time. Uh, nine brave souls embark, leaving Rivendell behind, trading light for dark. Yep. Nice. That's it. Right on. Not bad for a last minute haiku effort, is it, Johnny? No. No. It actually turned out not too shabby. Right. All right. Your turn. All right. Though strength of arms may protect and wisdom see far, friendship withstands all. Sorry, I spaced the first line. Can you do it again? Though strength of arms may protect and wisdom see far, friendship withstands all. Ooh, I like that. That's really good. Yeah. Pretty happy with that one. Yeah, I think that's that's really deep. Good. And thoughtful. I dig it. So I can get it if that was real nice. That was real nice. Yeah. That's going to be real nice. That was real nice. Mm Mm-hmm. All right. Good job, Johnny. Thank you. Um, Super fans. uh, Well, you know, here's the thing. Josh uh, DM'd me on Twitter. Meaning like that, mean? that it's like a direct message. That's oh. the Twitter lingo. Oh, is that the Twitter lingo? Yeah. I wouldn't know. Yeah. Because I'm never on social media. Uh, DM. And That's he was so like, funny. he was like, yo, check it out. I'm recording a Star Wars podcast, so I'm not sure if I'm going to get my haiku in. What? And I was all like, say what? Uh, you did not abandon oh, the Tolkien Road for gosh. a Star Wars podcast. It's all like, nerd. Seriously? <laughs> Come on, man. Josh. Well, Josh will have to make it up with, uh, you know, like like two or three or four haikus next time just to make up for it. So we do still expect your book two, chapter three haiku. We do. Um, nor, uh, yeah. Well, it's a good thing that Josh is recording a Star Wars podcast because there's probably not any others out there. Probably not, yeah. Because you know, There's not there's a whole lot of Star Wars fans. There's not it's kind of very a, many Star it's Wars kind of a fans. New, uh, it's kind of a new field of... You know, mm-hmm. scientific exploration, you know. It's with, pretty much uh, a novelty. With literary exploration, you know. I mean, it's mm-hmm. a... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the only thing they have out is that holiday special, right? That, I think so. You know, that holiday special. Yeah. Where, uh, with those, like, with goofy those, robots. Right, the ones in white. Bill Murray singing the theme song. Star Wars. <laughs> wonderful Star Wars. Oh, wow, this just got weird. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a real thing. Oh, is it for real? Bill Murray, yeah. Singing Star Wars? On SNL back in, like, 78. Oh. Yeah. I didn't even know about that. Yeah, so anyway, Josh is, uh... I can't believe it. Josh. I feel so betrayed. Yeah, well... Can you please pull the knife out of my back? It's really beginning to bother me. Maybe we'll just call him Darth Sosa from now on. Darth Sosa. <laughs> <laughs> from henceforth, he should be called Darth Sosa. Darth Sosa. Darth Sosa. <laughs> See if we ever read your haikus on the air again. <laughs> Deserter. We'll probably read them again. Traitor. All right, Josh. So much for those classical you still studies. Owe us a, you still owe us a haiku for us, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> oh, uh, man, my finals are coming up. Boy, <laughs> this is so hard. Um, uh, well, we wish you the best in your new podcast, Josh. We really do. But well, we still expect I don't know if it's, I don't know if he's actually doing a whole podcast. I think he might oh. have just been like a guest on a podcast. I don't know. Oh, I see. But, uh, well, we still expect your haiku. Yeah. And hope the podcast goes well. Right. Yeah. 
So yeah, but we yeah, we need a haiku. We need your haiku. We do need a haiku. A haiku is late. We appreciate you sending in your excuse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, Mary Grace. Mary Grace, I knew she wouldn't let us down. Well, I, of course. Of course. She's I Mary Grace. She's, she's got finals coming up too. I bet. Yeah, she probably does. Mm-hmm. And, and yet, I bet she likes Star Wars too. I bet she does like Star Wars. Yeah. So. But yet she still got her haiku in. So that's awesome. So we're gonna call her. Uh, Mary Grace Skywalker. Mary Grace Skywalker. Yeah. I like that. Or how about uh, we can maybe Mary Grace Walker? Mary Grace Walker. Yeah. Grace Walker. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. We got Darth Sosa and Mary Grace Walker. <laughs> Speaking of light and dark. That's right. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. So she sent in two and... Um, I think I'm gonna read the second one because I have I have a hard time pronouncing the first line of the first one because it's in the black tongue of oh, Mordor. Morgul, Mordor. Yeah. Mm. Um, so I'll read the second one. All right. Anduril, flame of the west, sting, Mithril, all to protect Frodo. I like it. Yep. I like it. You and she had similar themes, right? With your war. Stuff, mm-hmm. like mentioning. Yeah. War gear. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. Right on. I like it. Thank you, Mary Grace. Good stuff. As always. All right. Um, and then Lars. Lars. Good old Lars. Good awesome. old Lars working. Um, I always see his last name, and I want to say it Berkman. How's it spelled? W-E-R-K-M-A-N. Uh, so maybe Lars. Is your last name Workman or is it Verkman? That's what I'm wondering. So maybe you can let us know. Yeah. Just let us know. Just let us know. Dying to know. We could just call him Lars. Yeah. Well, it you know, gives his last name, so. Yeah. We don't want to mispronounce it. So yeah, let us know. Mm-hmm. Covines, well, let's hear it. Uh, sought intelligence for a perilous journey. Pippin won't avail. Read the first line again. Yeah. the whole thing. Actually. Sought intelligence for a perilous journey. Pippin won't avail. I like it. Yeah. I like it. That was one of my favorite parts of the chapter. Yeah. Gandalf likes pick, picking on Pippin. He does. I know. I'm like, dude, pick on someone your own size. Well, Pippin's kind of a goofball. And Pippin seems to actually like not mind it very much. He thinks no, he, he kind of. I think it he well. likes. Yeah. He's one. He's. You know, I've never been like this, so it's weird for me to understand. But like. There's some people that, like, the more you pick on them, the more they just feed off of it. And, like, mm-hmm. and the more they just do their, do whatever the thing is you're picking on them for, you know? Yeah. I've known people like that. Yes. And it's a good personality trait to have, I think, because it shows some, you know, kind of self-confidence and mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I think a healthy amount of self-confidence, to a certain extent. I would agree with that. Anyway. Yep. Yeah, so right on. Good job. Nicely done, Lars. Nice, nicely done. The haiku. Yeah, that was pretty good haiku time. I like yep. that. Yeah, good job. Yeah. All right, All so right, chapter three, chapter the ring goes three. south. The ring goeth south. South. Yes. South. The ringeth goeth south. If. South if. Yeah. South if. So okay. we start off, and um, we, we pick up where, you know, right after the Council of Elrond, and they're still mm-hmm. at Rivendell. Right. And um, Gandalf and the hobbits are all hanging out in Bilbo's room having just a chat about everything. After the council. After the council. Yep. And, um, of course, Sam is the only one who's definitely going um, at this point. And so there's really only two that we know are going. And Merry and Pippin are a little bit jealous of Sam because they kind of say, like, you know, it's not fair that Elrond allowed you to go. You were doing something you weren't supposed to be and you were rewarded. Right. You weren't supposed to be doing and you were rewarded for well, it. They think it's a reward, right? Yeah. Frodo is very quick to tell them, this is not, you may, it may look like a reward to you, but you have, isn't it Frodo? Yeah. That's why he basically corrects them and says, this is not a reward, people. Right. Well, I, But I, you can see where they're coming from. Yeah, well, and I love this about the hobbits because all of them are unwavering in this desire to go with Frodo. Yeah. You know? Yeah. They just don't care. 
And yeah, there's, there, there probably is some degree of like, they don't know what they're getting themselves right. into, but, some night, night um, but, but there's also this like intense friendship, you know, that you can underneath, underneath mm-hmm. it all that, um, yeah. Yeah. You know, that, that speaks well of hob the, the, the hobbit species in general. Right. You know? Yeah. The one to stick together. And... Yeah. Yeah. I did. Um, yeah, so um, they're all hanging out, talking about, um, you know, talking about Sam and Frodo going to be setting out and who else might set out. Gandalf wants to go, mm-hmm. um, but he's not sure that he will yet. Right. So um, he says, I only said I think I shall come. Do not count on anything yet. In this matter, Elrond will have much to say and your friend the Strider. Which reminds me, I want to see Elrond. I must be off. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, I really like what, um, I feel like Bilbo is very interesting in this chapter. Um, it's, it's the last we hear of Bilbo for a while, um, because he doesn't end up going with him on the journey, but Bilbo is really into telling stories at this point. Mm -hmm. And, um, he is, he has basically become a storyteller and, um, and, and towards the end of this little first little section here, um, Bilbo says, um, "They're talking about how this all might how this all might end." And um, Bilbo asks Frodo, uh, "What about helping me with my book and making a start in the next? Have you thought of an ending?" And Frodo says, "Yes, several, and all are dark and unpleasant." And Bilbo says, "Oh, that won't do. Books ought to have good endings." How would this do? And they all settled down and lived happily, lived together happily ever after. Um, I really like that. Uh, you know, the typical fairy tale ending is they lived happily ever after. Mm-hmm. I like that Bilbo throws in there. They all settled down and lived together happily ever after. You know, mm-hmm. that bringing still continuing that camaraderie. And yeah, that, yeah, that sense of that sense, sense of camaraderie. Of and yeah, yeah. Um, but Bilbo is already cons- is already ha- has this kind of confidence that there's going to be a happy ending. Yes, you know he does. Uh, and maybe you know maybe that's because he's been on all these adventures already, and, it, and he always had a happy ending. Um, yeah, true. But this isn't this isn't going to be your typical fairy tale either. You know, yeah. what we're going to find. But you gotta you gotta appreciate his optimism. Mm-hmm. Because he's really the only one I feel like in this chapter that actually is really trying to keep everybody's spirits up. Yeah. Everybody else is like, who are me? I have to leave Rivendell, trudge through the sea and get rid of the ring, and I'm probably going to die. Yeah. And Bill was like, come make sure you get back in time to help me with my book. It's like, that's easy to say for you. You're hanging out in exactly. Rivendell Exactly, I know. Year. I was going to say, it's yeah. really easy for him to be in a good mood because he's, He's not doing all the hard stuff that these other people are gonna have to do. Mm-hmm. But you gotta appreciate his at least trying to keep the mood light and yeah, you know, keep their spirits up as yeah. best he can. Of course, I like the little aside that Sam has at the very end of the section. <laughs> yes. And, <laughs> and where will they live? That's what I often wonder. <laughs> Sam, Sam just Sam just cracked. Like yeah. Sam has a couple of good, like really great little lines yes, like that in this chapter. Liners, yes. Um, but but it's like, no one's like Sam. Like, no one thinks like Sam. No, no one. How many fairy tales have we read that have ended? And they lived happily ever after. Yeah. Never once have I thought, where? Where yeah. are they living? That's right. <laughs> and where will they, li- where will they live? That's what I often really wonder. Matter. What matters is that they're happy. That's right. right? Yep. Home is where the heart is. Um, yeah, that, I thought that was funny. Yeah, I like the little, I like the little just couple of paragraphs in here, too, about the time passing. Because even, even between then and... This and when they actually leave, there's a significant amount of time that passes. So the day slipped away right. as each morning dawned bright and fair, and each evening followed cool and clear. But autumn was waning fast. Slowly the golden light faded to pale silver, and the lingering leaves fell from the naked trees. A wind began to blow chill from the misty mountains to the east. The hunter's moon waxed round in the night sky and put to flight all the lesser stars. But low in the south, one star shone red. Every night, as the moon waned again, it shone brighter and brighter. Frodo could see it from his window, deep in the heavens, burning like a watchful eye that glared above the trees on the brink of the valley. 
So they're waiting for the scouts to come back. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So Ron has sent out a bunch of people just to kind of see what's going on. Mm-hmm. And do To make sure, spying. basically, the Black Riders haven't returned. Right. You know? But to get a feel for what they're walking into. Right. So that's what they're waiting on. Right? Yeah, what, they're waiting for the reports to come back. Right. And what direction it would be best for them to go and right. that sort of thing. Right. Um, so the decision is made that they're basically going to go down the western side of the Misty Mountains as they go south, and they're going to look for the uh, Demerol uh, Dale, which is, right. there's a stairway there that basically goes over the mountains. Um, so they're going to travel pretty far south, and once they cross over there, that will put them into the land of Lorien, which is a um, a little bit of a safer area. Okay. So, um, you know, when in The Hobbit, when the... Um, when they set out from Rivendell, they went over the Misty Mountains directly, right? And so Mm -hmm. they're not going that way. They're not going into that dangerous place that they were before, but they're going to go south, which is also kind of dangerous, but there's really at this point not much, not many places that are dangerous. Okay. Um, Yeah. So uh, they're still, um, they still, we still haven't put together the fellowship though. And then Mm -hmm. so, in the next section, it deals with the putting together of the fellowship, and the decision is made to do nine because mm-hmm. there's nine riders, there's mm-hmm. nine black riders. Mm-hmm. So the thought is that they are the nine walkers shall be set against the nine riders that are evil. Right. Um, with you and your faithful servant Gandalf will go, for this shall be his great task and maybe the end of his labors. Uh, and then he's, that's a little um, doom ish, right? Yeah. That this could be it, right? This could be it for Gandalf. Is that what he's saying? Well, Elrond knows a lot about Gandalf's background, mm-hmm. right? Um, Gandalf is, if you'll recall, we've talked about this a tiny bit. One of these days, we'll read a little bit more about and a little bit more about his background. But Gandalf is a—I um, uh, mean, he comes from the Blessed Realm, right? He came over here mm-hmm. from the Blessed Realm, right? Um, and he is a my, he is a Maiar. Right. Yes. So, um, he was sent here with a very specific mission long ago, and mm-hmm. Elrond, as one of the great, you know, the great people of Middle Earth, would have known about this. So. So it's saying this may be the fulfillment of his mission. Of what he came to do, okay. right? So it's not like okay. he's like doomed to die. It's like this I may see. be the fulfillment okay. of his mission. Okay, got it. Um. Yeah. So and then so that's three, and then. Mm-hmm. Uh, Elrond decides that there's going to be one from each race of the free peoples of the world mm-hmm. to accompany. So Legolas shall be accompanying from the elves, mm-hmm. Gimli from the dwarves, and um, Aragorn, son of Arathorn, from the from men. So that's six. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and then Boromir is going to come uh, since he's going in that direction anyway. Uh, so he's going to accompany them. So that's seven. Boromir is a dwarf, right? No, Boromir is a man. Boromir is the son. Oh, of... that's right. That's right. He's the son. Okay. That's yeah. Right. Okay. Um. Yeah. So, I can't believe you just said Boromir. I know. Can you like rewind and erase that like, part? So I'm like, my mind is like blown. <laughs> I got Boromir and Bomber mixed up. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. That's what I did. Remember, Bomber's like too fat to even move now. So he has to have like four young dwarves have to like cart him around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry, Boromir's the guy from Gondor, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Yeah, so uh, that leaves two spots left and immediately um, uh, Elrond, well, Elrond first thinks that he's going to send two of his own household. Right. And then Pippin pipes up and says... Um, but that will leave no place for us. We don't want to be left behind. We want to go with Frodo. Um, and even though Gandalf had, you know, has kind of started making this habit of, um, of looking for any opportunity to, to tell Pippin what an idiot he is, Mm -hmm. um, he actually agrees with Pippin here. Mm -hmm. Um, Gandalf says, uh, nor do any of us see clearly. He's saying this to Elrond. It is true that if these hobbits understood the danger, they would not dare to go. But they would still wish to go, or wish that they dared, and be shamed and unhappy. 
I think, Elrond, that in this matter it would be well to trust rather to their friendship than to great wisdom. Even if you chose for us an elf lord such as Glorfindel, he could not storm the dark tower, nor open the road to the fire by the power that is in him. Um, it is well. It would be well to trust rather to their friendship than to great wisdom. Mm-hmm. Great stuff. Mm-hmm. Great stuff. Absolutely. Um, yeah, which is of itself, I think, a very wise thing that Gandalf chooses here. You're going into this mm-hmm. dark, and that's that was kind of the theme of my haiku, right? That I wrote. Mm-hmm. It's like you're going into this really thing where you don't know where you're, where, really what you're getting mm-hmm. into. You can yeah. see a little bit ahead, but you can't see way far ahead. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to that, um, what is the most important thing to have? Well, it might just be true, like true friendship, like the kind the of loyalty. friendship that will never yeah. abandon you, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, great, great little snippet from Gandalf there. Right. And just the moral, you know, it's the moral fortitude and encouragement of just being with somebody that you know knows you and that you know and that you can trust implicitly. Mm -hmm. That really is a priceless thing. Yeah. Especially when you're going on such a dangerous errand. Right. As this. Right. So, I mean, there are plans for... I mean, to be honest, when I read that Elrond was going to be, you know, thinking about sending a couple of his people in cell, I was like, oh, that would probably be the smarter thing to do. Right? Right. I mean, elves are, you know, they're... They're braver and they're, you know, really good with their bows and arrows and they're pretty great warriors. So maybe, maybe it would make more sense to send the, the elves, but, um, but you can't, you can't put a price tag on all the benefits that a good friend, um, you know, that a good friend brings to the mix. So. Yeah, indeed. Um. Plus, you need the comic relief in there from Pippin, so... Of course. Yeah. Well, and, and Elrond, I'm sure, was, uh, was aware of that. He was probably thinking of that, yeah. too. He's like, this will be a much more exciting yeah. story if yeah. we just let Mary and Pippin go. Somebody's going to make him laugh. Yeah, way. right? Um, well, Elrond, even then, after Gandalf speaks, still thinks that he's going to send Pippin back. Um, right, he agrees to let Mary go. Which yeah. way is that? Do you know? Uh, well, he says... Uh, I thought to send back there as messengers to do what they could according to the fashion of their country to warn the people of their danger. In any case, I judge that the younger of these two peregrine hooks should remain. My heart is against his going. He doesn't give a reason, though. No. He might just think he's a little bit foolish. Uh, um, yeah. Then, Master Elrond, you will have to lock me in prison or send me home tied in a sack, said Pippin, for otherwise I, should, I shall follow the company. Um, and then Elrond basically like, all right. Bye. Fair enough. You win. Yeah. Um, and then in seven days, the company shall depart. Right. So, um, so from there, they start collecting all their things necessary for the journey. Um, there's a little snippet about listening to the story of Baron and Luthien and the winning of the Great Jewel. Um, yes. And uh, we also have Bilbo passing along a few heirlooms to Frodo. Yep. First of all, he passes along Sting, the sword. That he found when uh, on his first journey, um, and then he passes along the mithril mail. Uh, mm-hmm. It was close woven of many rings, as supple almost as linen, cold as ice, and harder than steel. Uh, it shone like moonlit silver and was studded with white gems. With it, with it was a belt of pearl and crystal. Um, so he gives them, you know, this mithril mail, which is this really, you know, chain mail. While it can protect you. You know, from some you know blows with swords and that kind of thing. I suppose, not that I've ever worn it, um, but I would assume it's also kind of heavy. Yes, you know? it is very. But this mithril mail is like even stronger than chain mail, and but it's light. Light. It's like yeah. wearing just like a t-shirt. Yes. Almost. You know. Yeah. Um. And it's beautiful. So. Mm-hmm. It sounds gorgeous. Yeah. Um. And um, I think so. I love this little poem that uh, that Bilbo says uh, here on 271. After he hands it over his right. heirlooms, yeah. Yeah. Um, he says, uh, I'll do my best to finish my book before your return. I should like to write the second book if I'm spared. And then he, t- he breaks off and kind of turns to the window and sings softly to himself. Or sings softly. Um, so why don't we read this poem? Um, I'll start out, and then you read. We'll just read every other stanza. Okay. Okay. 
I sit beside the fire and think of all that I have seen, of meadow flowers and butterflies and summers that have been, of yellow leaves and gossamer and autumns that there were, with morning mist and silver sun and wind upon my hair. I sit beside the fire and think of how the world will be when winter comes without a spring that I shall ever see. For still there are so many things that I have never seen. In every wood and every spring there is a different green. I sit beside the fire and think of people long ago, and people who will see a world that I shall never know. But all the while I sit and think of times there were before. I listen for returning feet and voices at the door. Yeah. So, um, I just love that. I love yeah. that poem. I think it's, I think it's beautiful. Um, mm. uh, it's just, you know, just kind of poem where you're sitting there and just reminiscing, thinking yeah, it's about... It's kind of a lament. Yeah, in a way, it's a little. It's definitely a twinge of sadness in it. Mm-hmm. Um, when winter, how the world will be when winter comes without a spring that I shall ever see. Mm-hmm. For still there are so many things that I have never seen. In every wood and every spring, there is a different green. You know, Bill, this is a song of someone who's growing old. You mm-hmm. know, it is. and realizes they can't go out and you know they've they've kind of seen everything they're going to see probably. Yeah. And um, of, thinks of people long ago and people who will see a world that I shall never know. Yeah. Do you think this is um, like his way of expressing regret that he can't go with Bilbo on the journey? I mean, I'm sorry, he can't go with Frodo? Maybe, yeah. That's a good thought. He says, I listen for returning feet and voices at the door. Like, instead of being the one going out on the adventure, right, he's stuck at home Mm -hmm. listening, anxiously waiting to return those who were able to go. Right. I think so, and... I like the last little bit, but all the while I sit and think of times there were before. I listen for returning feet and voices at the door. So there's a little bit of hopefulness that ends it. You know, he lists, he's listening for returning feet and voices at the door. Right. Uh, there's I someone, still think he's sad that he's not one of those returning yeah. feet, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Nifty little... Yeah. Nifty little poem there. Mm-hmm. Well, why don't we pause and take a break, and okay. uh, then we'll come back and finish the chapter sounds like a plan all right don't go away stay tuned do you know the tale that tolkien called the kernel of the middle earth mythology baron and luthien is the story of an outlaw mortal and an elvish princess tasked with obtaining a silmaril one of the holy jewels of the blessed realm from the iron crown of the dark lord morgoth in my new book tolkien's requiem i explore the legend of these doomed lovers In doing so, I aim to provide a backdoor into the world of the Silmarillion for those who have struggled to give it a go. One of Tolkien's greatest achievements, the story of Baron and Luthien, deserves to be as well known as The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Get your copy of Tolkien's Requiem today by visiting truemyths.org slash baron. That's truemyths.org slash b-e-r-e-n. Happy reading! All right, and we're back. So, they're, uh, the last thing they have to do before they set out is make sure they've got all the gear they need. Yep. Um, the thing I want to highlight here is Sam's inventory. Yes. Um, I think because I think it's the most um, humorous. I mean, of course, um, Aragorn uh, brings. They they don't bring a lot. Is the first thing they're yeah. they're really not bringing a lot with them. Um, uh, the company took little gear of war for their hope was in secrecy, not in battle. Aragorn had Andoril, but no other weapon, and he went forth clad only in rusty green and brown as a ranger of the wilderness. Boromir had a long sword and fashioned like Andoril, but of less lineage, and he bore also a shield in his war horn. And of course, he has to let the uh, war horn blast. Give it a test run. Gives it a blast. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, we kind of list off what everybody else has, uh, and we come to Sam. It says, Sam eased the pack on his shoulders and went over anxiously in his mind all the things that he had stowed in it, wondering if he had forgotten anything. His chief chief treasure, his cooking gear, and the little box of salt that he always carried and refilled when he could. A good supply of pipeweed, but not near enough, I'll warrant. Flint and tinder, wool and hose, linen, various small belongings of his masters that Frodo had forgotten, and Sam had stowed to bring them out in triumph when they were called for. (laughs) He went through them all. And then rope, he muttered. No, rope. And only last night you said to yourself, Sam, what about a bit of rope? You'll want it if you haven't got it. Well, I'll want it. I can't get it now. 
So. Darn it, he forgot the rope. I know. I just, I love how he's like, you just said to yourself last night, Sam, <laughs> that you'd want a rope. Self? I said, self? Yeah. Why don't you go out here and get some rope? I love that little line about he he makes sure and picks up all these little things that Frodo yeah, had forgotten. Yeah, Frodo forgot. So he's he a hero. Yeah, right. Can you bring him out in triumph? Yep. Um, oh, you forgot that? Well, swing. Yeah. Here it is. You just thought you might need it. That's right. That's a good friend. Yes, indeed. Um, and so they set out, and Elrond says one last thing. He says, The ring bearer is setting out on the quest of Mount Doom. On him alone is any charge laid, neither to cast away the ring, nor to deliver it to any servant of the enemy, nor indeed to let any handle it, save members of the company and the council, and only then in gravest need. The others go with him as free companions to help him on his way. You may tarry or come back or turn aside into other paths as chance allows. The further you go, the less easy will it be to withdraw. Yet no oath or bond is laid on you to go further than you will. For you do not yet know the strength of your hearts, and you cannot foresee that which may meet that which each may meet upon the road. Um, so Elrond has his final final little say, final little list of instructions for what they're gonna do. Mm-hmm. And um, and then there's this great little exchange between Elrond and Gimli, um, that's indicative maybe of the uh, ongoing tension between dwarves and elves. Gimli says, Faithful is he that says farewell when the road darkens. Yes. And Elrond says, Maybe, but let him not vow to walk in the dark who has not seen the nightfall. And then Gimli says, Yet sworn may, word may strengthen quaking heart. And Elrond says, Or break it. Look not too far ahead, but go now with good hearts. Farewell, and may the blessing of elves and men and all free folk go with you. May the stars shine upon your faces. I almost just wish that, like, dialogue, that back and forth between Gimli and Elrond could, like, just go on for, like, a whole page. Just keep going going, I know. You know, it's just like, let's see who can come up with the wittiest, mm-hmm. you know, retort. The wittiest retort, yes. You know? Yeah, I agree. Battle of, witty, battle of witty retorts, you know, and, and like, aphorisms and sayings. Yep. Proverbs and <laughs> all these things back and forth. Um, so, anyway, it tickled me. But I like how Bilbo's last word is about... Um, is about keeping a diary. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't suppose you'll be able to keep a diary, but I shall expect a full account when you get back. He's always think he's thinking about that story, yes. telling the story. Right. So. So yeah. They set out. And they're off. And they're off. They set out going south, and um, not too much happened. It's kind of a bleak land. It's not. There's not much. Um, it's it's kind of a bleak rolling land. There's not much to see. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not much civilization nope. between Rivendell and where they're going. Um, and before you know it, they've gone five and 40 leagues, 45 leagues as the crow flies, which I looked up a league. Do you know how long a league is? I don't is? know. I know about that book, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Yeah. I know that's really far. Yeah. I don't know. Is it in miles? It is. Yeah. What is it? It's about three and a half miles. A league One is about league three and a half miles. One league is three and a half hours? Yeah. Hour? Three and a half miles? Yeah. Whoa, Nelly. It's so that way means, longer than I thought it was. Yeah, that means they traveled about 160 miles. So. Oh, as the crow flies. Okay, so it'd be less than that. Okay, wait. The, as the crow flies mean in a straight line. One league is three hundred three and a half miles. Yeah. So they traveled 540 when you multiply by three and a half? Oh, they traveled 45 leagues. 45 times three and a half is... Oh, I thought they traveled 500. 135 plus uh, 17.5, so... I must have misread it. Oh, I'm sorry, plus uh, 22.5, so... So how long? Okay. So about 160 miles. Okay, okay. That's a long way to walk. Yeah, it is. I was thinking about that. I mean, 160 miles, gosh, that would be like walking from here to uh, to like Louisville or something like that. Yeah, just walking by foot. Mm. Really? Is it that? Yeah. Wow. Wow. All right. Well, that's really good. Yeah. I like that. Some good walking. Good job, guys. That is some really good walking. It was like, wow, nice walking. Kind of reminds me, I read this quote about, a quote from Martin Luther King today. Mm -hmm. He was talking about the march, the Selma. Oh, right. The Montgomery march. Yeah. And he said something to the effect of, um... Something about how uh, the 
that they mar that while that through this march or at the end of I think he was talking <clears throat> excuse me the, the the protesters that had arrived in Montgomery and he said something the fact that that their mar that at the end of their march their feet will be tired mm -hmm. but their souls will be rested. I thought nice. that was beautiful. Yeah. And that's, I think, what they're doing here, too, right? Like, they're, while they're on this journey, their feet are going to be tired. Uh -huh. But their souls will be rested, knowing that they're doing the right thing. They're doing what they're supposed to do to help preserve yeah. humanity. Yeah. I thought that was nice. That is nice. Yeah. It's a very, uh, it's a nice turn of phrase. It is a nice turn of nice phrase. Nice turn of I phrase. Mm -hmm. little, little play on words. Absolutely. Um... So, um, you know, they, they, they kind of talk about the different mountains that they're seeing. Um, at one point, they talk about where they're going. They said, only once before have I seen them from afar in waking life, but I know them and their names, for under them lies Casa Doom. That's what Gimli said, right? Right. The Dwaro Elf. Mm -hmm. That is now called the Black Pit, Moria in the Elvish tongue. Yonder stands Barazenbar, the Red Horn, cruel Karathras. And beyond him are Silvertine and Cloudy Head. Kalebdil the white, and Fon Widhol the gray, that we call Zirak Zigil, and Bundushathur. Bundu yeah, so these are hard names to say. Those are very hard names to say. Um, and uh, they most definitely want to go over the mountains, because going under them means that they would have to go through Moria, Khazadum, which is a uh, dark place now. Right. No one knows what lurks there. Yes. Um... And um, Gandalf, you know, has good words here. To the um, uh, is they're talking about. Well, what do we do when we get over? You know, when we get over the mountains, when we finally do cross over the mountains. And Gandalf says, um, "We go to the end of the journey. We cannot look too far ahead. Let us be glad that the first stage is safely over. I think we will rest here, not only today but tonight as well. There is a wholesome air about Holland. Much evil must befall a country before it wholly forgets the elves, if, if once they dwelt there. Uh, and so that's a good point. So. Where they are, where they've basically journeyed to at this point, is this region called Holland. Do you have a map? Do you have the map in your book? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, here you go. My maps are lost on me. Oh, okay. Well, basically, they've traveled south from Rivendell on the west side of the mountains, and they've arrived at this little area here called Eregion, uh, or Eregion, and then Holland in parentheses. And this used to be... This at one point was... Um, like a great elvish kingdom in the second age, mm. right? Um, and it was actually where the rings, where many of the rings were forged. Oh, so, okay. um, uh, you know, there's more, more story to be told there, but um, when we, when we go back to Calabath, we'll look at that. But yeah. anyway, um, yeah, it's, this is, this is an area that was once inhabited. Uh, it was basically an elvish kingdom at one point and okay. it no longer is. It's been, it's been abandoned since then. So, um, that's where they are, um, and, uh, they're, they're basically getting ready to go up over the mountains when they realize, um, and they're going to be taking this nice staircase that's been, you know, carved and it'll easily go over the mountains, easier than like climbing a mountain and trying to go over it that way, right. when they see this cloud of birds coming and, they are terrified and realize that this might be um, the work of the enemy. This might, these might be spies. Crows. Yeah. Evil crows. Mm -hmm. uh, they are, he says, um, the, these birds are not natives here. They are Crebane out of Fangorn and Dunlund. I do not know what they are about. Possibly there is some trouble away south from which they are fleeing, but I think they are spying out the land. They've also seen hawks flying high up in the sky. Right. Um, and so, um, so they decide that they must go, uh, they must move over the mountains. Um, and, um, uh, and so they attempt to go over Carothras. Carothras. That's the mountain, right? Right. This is a really tall mountain. Yeah. Um, Carothras does not like them. No. Carothras has, uh, you know, each of these mountains seems to have some kind of spirit associated with it. Yes. You know, um, I liked 
that uh, I like that the um, if you it's actually a couple we jump a couple of pages to get to this, but I like what Aragorn says about um, when they start hearing the noise on the wind. Aragorn says, yes, "I do yes. call it the wind, but that does not make what you say untrue." There are many evil and unfriendly things in the world that have little love for those that go on two legs and yet are not in league with Sauron but have purposes of their own. Some have been in this world longer than he. So, you know, this is another one of those things that gets at the the idea that there's all this stuff in this world that that don't really even necessarily fall into the stories that we that, that we have a lot of knowledge of in Middle Earth, right? Um Kind of like Tom Bombadil, how he's just this, you know, this spirit, this spirit that nobody knows where he came from. Mm-hmm. Um, in a way, Carothras is like a an evil version of that, you know. Mm. Carothras is like this, um, some kind of spirit that has no, that doesn't care anything about what Sauron thinks or anybody else. But he, that just because he's not a fan of Sauron, doesn't mean that he's okay with the the fellowship. Right. Right. Yes. So. Um, yeah. They call him the cruel, don't they? Yes. Called the cruel. Yes. So, uh, yeah, moving along, um, the hobbits are, uh, are getting really cold as they try and go over the mountain. Well, it's snowing. Yeah. Like, it's blizzard conditions. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, Gandalf busts out the, um, Miruvor. The cordial of Imladris. Yeah, I want some of that. Gives it to them, and uh, they suddenly feel a little better. I should put like a bit of that in my coffee every morning. Yeah, that'd be awesome. It would be awesome. Mm-hmm. It would indeed be awesome. But it helps them all kind of get back on their feet, mm-hmm. right? Falls them out. And... Gandalf works a little magic. Starts a starts a fire. Yes. Naron Adroth Aman Aman. He he thrusts the end of his staff into the midst. Yes. And um, a great stop of green and blue flames sprang out, snow. and the word and the wood flared and sputtered. I'm sorry, no, you're yeah, right. yeah, you know, this will only last for so long. Hmm? This, little, this little fire will only last right, for so long. Right, but before he did that, didn't someone suggest that he like burn a tunnel through the snow for them? Oh, Boromir yeah, Boromir does. Yeah, yeah. Now Come on, you may make a fire if you can. If there are any watchers, oh wait, no, it's not it. Where was it? He says, I don't know, I forget. Some wizard you are. I know, right? You can't burn snow? What's up with that? Oh, well. He does make a fire for them. Oh, that comes later. So, yeah, he makes a fire for them. Because they had said that they really wanted to avoid using a fire if they could help it, right? Mm-hmm. It would give them, it would show them off to the enemy, possibly. Right. But now it looks like they're all about to freeze to death. Anyway, mm-hmm. right? So like, oh, fire's not gonna hurt, right? Right. So, right. Gotta build a fire. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I will say that there's not a whole lot more to this chapter that I really wanted to um, to highlight. I mean, basically, they try to go over Carothras. Carothras will have nothing of it, and uh, and then they end up having to go back down, and they realize they're gonna have to go under the mountain. Um, yeah. And it ends with the ominous little line of Carothras had defeated them. So, I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to, um, you know, highlight in this chapter. Um, no. So, I mean, they all come out alive, obviously. Yeah. But they basically have to retreat. Yeah. Right? And so, you say, you're saying that now, instead of using the stairs to go over the mountain, they're going to have to go under the mountain? Right. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And so, that gets, you know... Yeah, the the journey under the mountain, uh, chapter four, journey in the dark, is another chapter that I really love. Um, but yeah, this one just basically ends with, you know, they're not going to be able to to go that way. They got to go under. They got to go under. You got to go under in a deep dark. Yeah. Place. So, any other stuff you wanted to to chat about in this chapter? No, I think you okay. covered it well. That's well, right. good. Well, it's kind of an abrupt, maybe an abrupt end there, but uh, I, you <laughs> yeah, know, I, I kind of realized I like. Looking through all my notes, the things I'd highlight, and I'm like, I didn't highlight very much more of this chapter. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you feel like we left anything out, let us know. But, um, you yeah, know, I think we we, entered, we know where we are. We know where they yeah, are. We do. Absolutely. 
All right. That's a good, uh, a job well done, Johnny. Well, good. Um, well, so, you know, I think for the, for the next few episodes, we're just going to have to kind of play it by ear. Um, like I, like we said, May is going to be a very, um, uh, busy. busy month. Yes. The rest of May is going to be a very busy month for us, even a little bit into early June. And then things will kind of die off after that. So, uh, we're hoping to get some other episodes squeezed out during that time frame, but, um, you know, we'll continue on with um, Lord of the Rings. We are close to lining up our talk with our language expert, and I've got another idea for an interview that I've got to, um, I've got to propose to the certain person. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, we'll get them knocked out as we can. So just stay tuned, and yeah. um, you know, if it seems like it's been a little while since we published one, it won't be too much longer. Um, you know, I think we'll definitely have at least one more this month, if not more. And um, and then when we get back into June, we should be back on a regular, regular pace. Yep. So. Sounds like a plan. Sounds like a plan. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, John. All right. Thank you, Greta. My pleasure. And uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. Yes, absolutely. Send us uh, correspondence. Um, you can send it to uh, truemyths.org at gmail.com. Um, that's a way to contact us. Yep. Yep, so, uh, go to the Facebook page, like us, you know, we need to get some stuff set up that's actually Tolkien Road podcast kind of stuff instead of just true myths, but, uh, mm. yeah. Anyway. Yeah. We'll get there. We'll get there. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Yeah. All right. True story. All right, well, thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah, thanks, guys. So I'll catch you next time. Bye, y'all. Bye-bye.